so if you're one of the 10 people that was watching my videos back in 2020 before I became serious about YouTube, you might recognize this spot. Um, me and my wife came up here our first day outside of quarantine in Japan. And uh, it was our first time in Mashiko. And uh, we went up to this museum, but it was a Monday, so it was closed. And now it's uh, February of 2022. Yeah, I remember in that video I said, oh, we'll come back and go to this museum sometime. Nope, finally here to come to the museum. Um, my wife was literally, my wife doesn't really like Mashiko, so uh, she doesn't really come here. I think she's been here two times or three times in total. All right, let's go get a ticket, go into the museum. Uh, they have a special exhibit going on. Like most museums in Japan, the Mashiko Pottery Museum does a really good job marking what you can and cannot take pictures of. When I went, the special exhibit was on the fourth dimension. So it was about the different shapes uh, and forms of pottery. It started with more conventional designs and then moved on to more experimental ones. Uh, what I guess you could call modern art. Um, however, the heart of this is going to be the heart of the museum which is talking about the history of pottery in Mashiko. So just to start off, you have to talk about the ground and the soil. Um, the base layer around here, the oldest stuff you can find would be from the Paleozoic, which is 280 million years ago. Uh, on top of that, sand, soil, and other degrees, debris created new layers. Now, in the Cenozoic era, which would be 1.5 million years ago, Mashiko was underwater and swampy. Um, this created the clay deposits that they rely on for creating pottery here in Mashiko. Um, so, for example, at one of the mining sites for clay in Mashiko, the pottery, the clay is found from 5.5 meters underground to 8.5 meters underground. And it was this source of clay that began the creation of pottery in Mashiko. So going all the way back, let's talk about early people. So the Paleolithic era, people didn't make pottery. Um, that is one of our defining lines between the Paleolithic and following eras. Uh, people did not have pottery. Pottery was useful because we can use it as something to cook with, something for storage. So generally, these were hunter-gatherer bands. Um, they would use, you know, skins, leather, stone tools. Um, there's not a ton of archaeological evidence because Japan has very acidic soil. So fossilization is unlikely. There's only a few places fossils have been found of people back then. However, we have found stone artifacts. After that came the Jomon period. Um, this is when pottery started in Japan. Uh, the Jomon pottery was decorated by, when it was wet, they would take a uh, cord and they would press it against the wet clay to make the pattern. That's actually where the name Jomon comes from. And at this time, people are starting to become more sedentary. People are settling down, they're doing more agriculture, there's still hunter-gatherer bands. Um, there are still semi-nomadic people where maybe they spend the summer at one place and the winter in another. But people are beginning to develop more of a set pattern about where they live. They're living in places longer. Um, so now they're using more pottery. See, the problem with pottery is it's kind of heavy. Um, so if you are constantly on the move, you actually probably don't like pottery that much or you wouldn't have very much. Um, during the Jomon period, a lot of the pottery that was produced, we believe, or seems to have been used for cooking. Now, the next period is the Yaoi period. Um, this saw pottery get thinner and new designs added. Um, the Yaoi people moved into Japan, um, mixed with or replaced the Jomon people, and brought their own uh, technologies. They had a much more sedentary life. Um, they had bronze and iron metallurgy. Um, rice paddies were brought to Japan, so now we have intensive rice cultivation. 
Um, people are sedentary. They have their own homes. So now ceramics are even more useful for them uh, because you're not carting it everywhere. You have a house. You can store it. You want to store food and other supplies for the winter. And pottery is one vessel for that. Um, just like the Jomon period, the pottery is still fired at a low temperature. Um, it's not fired in a kiln or a furnace. Um, people would dig pits, um, put the pottery in there, and cover it with coal. So just like the Jomon period, it was probably cooked around 800 degrees. So after the Yayoi period, we now move into uh, a little bit of a different phase here. So now there's two types of pottery that's being found. So this is the Kofun period to the Henin period. So the first type we're going to talk about is uh, Haji pottery or uh, Hajiki. So this pottery, it's plain, it's unglazed, it's reddish in color, uh, and it also was a little more Spartan didn't have the decorations and the patterns of the yaoi, uh, pottery, um, size, shape. These are becoming more standardized. Um, so it spread from Western Japan to Eastern Japan. Uh, it was made at first by Yaoi because the pottery wheel hadn't been invented. Um, the same way as previous designs is it was using rings of clay. So you would literally just put the clay in a ring, squish, 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 Put another ring, squish, 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 squish. Put another ring, squish, 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 squish. Um, just like earlier pottery, it was uh, fired in the open. Um, during this time, pottery wheels started to become available, but at first they were used for secondary shaping. You would shape with the rings. You know, you'd make a ring of clay. You'd make a ring of clay. You make a ring of clay, and then you would use the pottery wheel to help shape it. Um, and also kilns started to be available, but they weren't really used for hajiuki. Uh, Hajike, sorry. Um, the other interesting thing is they made uh, Hanawe. So these were funeral objects. They might be shaped like uh, people, horses, houses, or chickens. Um, they were made of clay and they were placed at tombs as a funeral object. Now, at the same time, there was Su pottery or Suaki. So this was contemporary to Hajike pottery. Uh, but it was fired at higher temperatures, and it had a blue or gray color. Uh, so this is what a lot of people would call stoneware, because since it was fired at a higher temperature, uh, it was harder. So it seems to have originally been from Korea, but it was brought to Japan by uh, craftsmen that migrated. Um, but it had to be fired at a really high temperature, 1,100 degrees or more. Uh, so for this reason, it was much more difficult to make, and it was much more expensive. So at the beginning in um, the Kofan period, it was a luxury item. Uh, however, by the time we reached the Henin period, it was mass-produced, and it was having more utilitarian use. Normal people were using it. Um, locally in Mashiko, Mashiko was a center for the Suyeki, this uh, Sioux pottery. Um, they would fire it in these furnaces that look kind of like a tunnel and were built into the side of a hill. Now, just like uh, the hajiki, uh, the haji pottery, it was not purposefully glazed. Now, sometimes if it got hot enough, the ash would become a glaze and it might cover part of the pottery. Um, it's actually very pretty when that happens, um, but it wasn't a standard thing. At the end of the Henin period, glazes came about. And so this would be kind of the Middle e medieval period, Kamacho to Sengoku period. Um, now the designs are flourishing and there's lots of local designs. Um, different designs in different places, different styles, different glazes used. Now, this is where we get into Mashiko's modern ceramics industry, which is, is surprisingly new. Um, in 1852, or 1853, I've seen both dates, um, a man named Kasa, uh, Kasia Boro Otsaka, uh, he discovered that the local clay in Mashiko was ideal for ceramics, and so he started to make pottery in Mashiko Town. Now, at the time, Mashiko Town, as we know, it was actually divided into a few different political domains. 
So the Carbon Domain, uh, who ruled most of Mashiko, uh, actually encouraged this industry. Um, they encouraged more pottery and more production of pottery, so the industry grew. Um, now, of course, you know, you have the kilns, you have the potters, you have the people mining, and it's also a process to purify the clay. So when the clay comes out of the ground, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's got sand in it, it's got dust, it's got other impurities. So it would actually be ran through water, so the water would separate them out, and then the clay was taken, and then it would have to be um, basically kneaded. Um, I guess you could use your hands, but I think most people use their feet. So in the Edo period, um, over a dozen households, from what we can find in records, in Mashiko, were involved just in the business of hand kneading the clay. So this brought in lots of money and jobs. You know how industry works. There's the primary industry and there's all these supporting industries that go with it. So by 1964, so 12 or 11 years after the discovery, there were six kilns in Mashiko, and most of the products, most of this pottery that was being made, it was taken by riverboat to Edo. Um, that's part of why the Kanto Plains is really useful, is you can take boats, bring you down to Edo, the main city, so it was a good place to transport things. Lots of things were transported by boats. Um, also, uh, there was the Ottawa Domain, which controlled part of what is now Mashiko, and they also had two kilns. Um, at this time, Mashiko ware pottery uh, was simple, it had limited use of glazes, it was, uh, I guess, very utilitarian is the word to use. Now, of course, this all changed when the imaging era started. So these domains, they lost control of the kilns, and they lost control of the economy. So the number of kilns increased. Um, so now people, you know, would build their own. There was much more um, free enterprise at this time, where it's like, oh, you want to start a business? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Where back in the day, it was much more of a thing where, oh, I want to do this. Well, uh, go get permission from your dynamo. And a lot of times they weren't interested because uh, they were helping to bankroll these projects. So the end of the Edo period, Mashiko had 13 kilns. Um, 10 years later, this number had doubled. And then in another 10 years, it more than doubled again when 27 kilns opened over the next decade. So much of Mashiko's pottery was mass produced with uh, dobins, which are a type of teapot, being one of the most common. I actually should get one now that I think about it. Um, so of course, same thing, lots of industries uh, being supported. There's you know, the kilns, the potters, the painters, the people purifying clay, the people mining clay, the people shipping it, marketing. It's a huge industry. Uh, but the thing is, is that there's a little bit of the problem with the technology and lifestyles were changing. So. At the end of the Meiji era, there was less demand for pottery. Um, Tokyo is the nearby major city, um, and a lot of it had gone to gas and electricity. So now we were using, uh, you know, glass bottles. Uh, there's gas stoves. People are using metal pots, metal teapots, uh, metal pans to cook with. Um, people aren't having, you know little fires at home anymore that they're cooking over. They're cooking with more advanced technology, and the cities, and particularly the urban areas, were seeing this the most. So in 1903, though, um, Mashiko opened the Pottery Training Center to help train potters uh, and their successors. Uh, this is now called the Tuchigi Prefectural Ceramics Guidance Center. Um, and there were other things going on. In uh, July of 1913, the Mocha line reached Mashiko. Uh, in 1914, the telephone lines reached Mashiko. So now it was actually easier to ship your pottery. The post office had been a thing in Mashiko since 1876, but now you could deliver faster. Um, you could be more responsive to customers, but there were less customers. And you also weren't uh, piling everything on a riverboat and sending it down to Tokyo. Uh, it did mean that the Mashiko ware, 
particularly Mashiko Dobbins, did reach new markets. So they had a wider market than before, but demand was starting to slacken. Uh, this only got worse in 1920 when there was a depression. The economy's doing worse. Less people have money. They're not spending as much money. And so maybe they're making do with their old ceramics and they're not buying new stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, Mashiko's economy was staggering, but it got turned around by a disaster. On September 1st in 1923, the Great Kanto Earthquake hit Japan with a magnitude of 7.9, and it was an 11 on the Merkelli rating scale. For reference, that big earthquake that I lived through in Wallian was 6.1 magnitude and a 6 on the Merkelli scale. Not to go into too much detail, but anything over a 10 is basically a Hollywood disaster movie. Uh, fire of after the earthquake knocked over buildings, fires engulfed Tokyo, there were firestorms, landslides destroyed villages, uh, it pushed a village into the sea, a landslide pushed a passenger train into the sea, a 10 meter tall tsunami struck different parts of the coast, and between 105 and 142,000 people died. But in the after, and of course, even far away from the earthquake, things were destroyed, particularly things that could break, like ceramics, your plates, your bowls, your teapots, your daubins. I mean, at one location, about 60 kilometers from the epicenter of the earthquake, a giant Buddha statue was moved 60 centimeters, despite being a huge rock carving. So, yeah. Your cups, your plates, your bowls, and your mugs, and your teapots probably did not survive the earthquake. And what this ended up causing was this ended up causing a boom for ceramics demand. After the earthquake, people needed to rebuild, they needed to replace, and this led to an influx of buying of ceramics, which led to a boom in the economy of Mashiko. Um, that was also short-lived. The next depression hit in 1929, and once again, Mashiko was hit hard again. There was a decrease in the demand for tableware, for ornaments, and other ceramics patterns. Are you noticing a pattern yet? Because this will come up again. As most of the kilns in Mashiko were family-run, they were spared the labor disputes that were happening in other locations. Um, and quite a few had to switch to other types of ceramics, one of them being ceramic drainage pipes. So a little brief, brief, brief step away from history. In 1924, Soji Hamada moved to Mashiko and set up a, a kiln and a pottery shop. Um, okay. This will be really important later, actually. So he had recently returned to Japan from St. Ives in the UK, where he had been studying the pottery there, meeting other artists, um, and he ended up building his own community. He uh, relocated a farmhouse and other buildings that you'll see in another video. Um, he had this idea that he would just use local materials, and he actually quickly became a very influential potter in Mashiko, and Japan, as many other artists and acquaintances visited him at his restored farmhouse. Um, World War II put a break to this. Um, so during World War II, um, there was another major slump in demand for ceramics. Uh, resources were running low, people didn't have money. So once again, many uh, Mashiko suffered a slumping economy. Um, and a lot of um, a few kilns, you know, turned to producing ceramic pipes um, and kind of anything else they could. It really went to a lot of tableware and things people needed at home. So with World War II over, artistic exchange between Japan and other nations skyrocketed. And this was particularly important for Mashiko. So we talked about him earlier, Soji Hamada. Uh, he was a big part of this. He worked very hard. Um, as a potter and became very good. He was internationally recognized um, and he increased Mashiko's standing and, you know, people knowing about Mashiko. 
both in Japan and around the world. Um, and also right after World War II, uh, a young man named Tatsuno uh, Shimoka uh, became his apprentice. So Shimoka was his apprentice for three years. And then after that, he opened his own shop not very far from uh, Soji Hamada. So in 1955, Soji Hamada was recognized as a living national treasure. Um, his former student, uh, Tatsu Shimaka, he was recognized the same as a living national treasure in 1996. Um, both of these men were very influential. They had exhibits all over the world. Um, when their stuff goes up for auction, if you want it, you better have a deep, deep wallet. Um, so, so that's no, um, was also interesting. So he actually traveled around the world a bit, um, giving exhibits. Um, he would take apprentices, um, and all that. And even today, you have students from all over the world, when there's no COVID, uh, coming to Mashiko uh, to learn pottery. Uh, in fact, when we did a school trip, we went to uh, one of these studios where they make pottery, uh, had the students, one of the helpers, she was from the UK. She was an apprentice uh, learning to make pottery there. She helped me make that bowl. That, uh, I was very bad at pottery. I'll put it that way. Um, so when you go through the museum, their last sign kind of ends on this really, you know, really optimistic note about combining a beautiful, peaceful environment with a long history. Uh, Mashiko has become an attractive place for both Japanese and foreign potters. That's true. It, it's a very touristy town. Um, there's museums, pottery shops, historical sites. Um, and the sign ends on an optimistic note about the future. So I'm going to toss in a darker one. Pottery, like all art, is subject to the economic currents. In the good times, when money's flowing, people buy. When money is tight, or if people are nervous about the future, less money goes into art. That's the way it is for all art. But pottery, there's an added difficulty. It's risky and expensive to ship pottery. It's much more difficult to ship some pottery than it is to ship art. Uh, you know, we can roll up a painting, we can put it in tubes, and we can be very, very comfortable sending it through the mail. It's not as easy to send ceramics through the mail. They're much more easily damaged, they're much more easily broken, um, it's much more difficult. And so they rely much more on a local market, people coming, seeing something they like, and buying something. Uh, it's very easy to appreciate a painting or a woodblock print through a picture and be like, oh, I'm buying that one. It's much harder to do with ceramics. Um, the last piece of Mashiko ware that I bought, I bought it on a whim because I saw it in the window of a store and I liked it and I was like, yep, I want that. I gotta have that one. So COVID in particular because of the loss of tourism to Mashiko, um, has been particularly difficult on the town. People are traveling less and multiple pottery festivals have been canceled. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is during these times. People are spending less on art and they're not traveling as much. So hopefully uh, this upcoming pottery festival runs and brings much needed money and tourism and interest in Mashika Ware back into the community. This is the first of three videos I'm going to do about the Mashika Pottery Museum. If you've made it this far, I hope that I've earned a like button. If you haven't subscribed, I hope I've earned a subscription. If you want to get alerts about my videos, hit the bell button. So please like, comment, share, please. Go down to the comment section. Um, tell me what you think about this story. All right, one thing I do want to say about the Mashiko Museum, the Mashiko Ceramics Museum, is usually when museums have special exhibits, most of it is, you know, on, on loan from private collection or on loan from another institution. 
most of the stuff they had in the special exhibit was their own stuff. Uh, very few of it looked like it was borrowed from somewhere else. You know, the tags they have, you know, on, on loan from blah, 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 on loan from private collection. There was very, very few displays that had those tags. Most of it was their own private collection. So I kind of almost imagine they looked at their stuff and were like, ah, what are we going to do with all of this this time? Huh. Let's make an exhibit about the fourth dimension. Let's just pull all that stuff out of the closet. Actually, some of it looks like it might have been made for the exhibit, like this one and a few others that are very, very new.